upcoming scientists, especially young African scientists, can do better yeah. is by being very deliberate about making science a, 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 a no, normalizing science, you yeah. know, normalizing it the way we are. I see my son excited about, you know, going to space because it's normalized. It's in their yeah. everyday interaction. Yeah. I want to see them, my, my cousins growing up in Isiolo, talking about, you know, the moon landing because you yeah. as an astronaut talked about it or talking about the new cancer therapeutic that you are working on. Everyone, uh, welcome to my science journey. This time uh, we are featuring Dr. Anne McKenna, a phenomenal woman that I personally look up to. Uh, she is the co-director of the Africa Oxford Initiative. You've had a, a, a lot of achievements throughout the years, right? Well, <laughs> uh, what would you say is one achievement that you're mostly proud of? Well, I'm looking at it, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> it's right in front of my own eyes right now. Uh, okay. I mean... It's hard to say that there's any one thing that defines yeah. anybody's career. And yeah. people look back and they plan their careers backwards. You only see the points when you're looking back, when you're yeah. in the process going to the next step. You're not often, I think maybe some people are, but often you're not thinking this is going to be the biggest game changer thing that yeah. I'm going to do. And often even what you think is going to be the biggest thing doesn't always end up being that. So you only look at these things retrospectively. Um, and I think for me, the thing that I always go back to is whose life, who's sleeping better tonight because I lived, right? Um, yeah. And yeah. if it's just one person, that's good enough. If it's three people, that's even better. And and I think for me, I, I wasn't joking when I said I'm looking at it, but you represent all the, you know, 3,000 people that are within the AFOX network, but you also yeah. represent the future that I, I can envision, the work that you have done in the last four years, or less than that actually with us, represents what collectively all the scholars within our network are doing. Can you imagine the power of what yeah. you have done, what, you know, 10 other scholars, five, six, 30, 500 scholars have done. Imagine that multiplied by the communities that you will serve. Imagine our, our research fellows building solutions from epilepsy to energy crisis to music to, you know, the African cultural heritage. Put that yeah. together. Include that with innovation. People who are, you know, translating all these things into products at the bedside, into pharmaceuticals, yeah. into, you know, so new solar panels, new ways of energy storage, new ways of telling stories, new Netflix commercials, you know, name it. The multiplier effect of that, I mean, it's incredible if you think about it. And for me, the things that mm. give me joy is not that, you know, as I always tell the scholars, it's not that we have created this. It's because we were able, at some point in your journey, give you some water for the way. Yeah. You, know? yeah. you were already on your path yeah. to greatness. And yeah. by some some good luck or some grace and or blessing, yeah. whatever you subscribe to, we mm. met and we gave you some water for the journey and how beautiful to see what blossoms have come out of that little drops of water. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, that is, yeah, I don't know how to describe that, but thank you so much for for sharing, you know, uh, so much wisdom with us. Uh, I think so many of us are just still, you know, digesting and you know, <laughs> absorbing everything that you have shared. And also, I think it's a good idea that we are recording this so that, you know, people can still go back and, you know, relieve um, the wisdom that you've shared with us today. And, you know, I think it would be very unfair if I don't ask this question, <laughs> you know, as, as I think it's important um, because people are, have been able to see how you moved from the science career into you know the capacity building aspect and how you're working together with others you know and collaborating to build uh, to build a better world um you know uh, and my question would be as a woman that is in this capacity and doing you know the sort of work that you do how do you sort of like manage to strike a balance between you know the career woman <laughs> the mother, the wife, you know, and, you know, just holding everything together 
um, in, in such a way that I remember, you know, is it last year that you were completing your executive MBA and, you know, plus that, but still, all in all, you were still able to excel in like each of these capacities. Maybe you can speak to us about that. I think a lot of us would benefit from that. <laughs> Hey, you know that question throws me every single time somebody asks because I'm thinking, should I say the right thing or the real thing? Um, the real thing. <laughs> <laughs> the real thing is nobody is managing it, guys. You yeah. know, nobody is having it all. Nobody is handling yeah. it all. Yeah. Nobody is swimming gracefully through parenting <laughs> and careers and all. All you see is like a Zoom yeah. call. All you're seeing yeah. right now is my bust. You don't know how paddling I am at the moment. <laughs> Please okay. don't be fooled. Please yeah. do not be fooled. And again, another thing I keep telling, and I say this to all the students that yeah. I mentor, um, but mostly I don't even call it mentoring. I think I, 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 they, they teach me more than I teach them. Yeah. And and I think the thing that the thing that is important to recognize is what you see outside. You're comparing the outsides of somebody with your insights. Yeah. Right. And that's not a fair comparison. Your outsides and somebody's insides are different. You know, your insides and somebody's outsides are very different. The stories that we tell of and, of and, and about ourselves is good to have those because they give people aspirations and, and yeah. make it feel like we can all make it. And that's true. With with enough grace and, and support and so forth, we, we can achieve a lot. And I don't want to yeah. downplay that at all. Yeah. But also yeah. to recognize that it takes it takes a whole sort of support systems. Yeah. It takes my yeah. husband doing yeah. drop-offs and pickups for months yeah. on end while yeah. I'm doing my MBA. It takes my yeah. colleagues at my folks picking up some of the work that I can't do because I'm busy, ex you know, cramming for an exam. <laughs> you yeah. Know? Yeah. It takes my friend and colleague Kevin saying, "Don't worry about these meetings. I'm gonna cover for you." Mm. It takes the scholars understanding that I can't take a call with each one of the 50 yes. of them yes. and yes. joining me in a group call. It takes yes. me explaining to my kids that, look, mommy can't come for that, you know, yeah. sports day and that, you know, you know, cake sale and all yeah. of those things. <laughs> and I'm not able to make it for all yeah. of those events, but yeah. I can make it for this one and the other one. It takes yeah. sacrifice from everybody. So yeah. really, I think... No, but one, nobody's got it all. Two, mm -hmm. don't look at the outsides and think that that's what's happening on the inside. And three, and yeah. most importantly, create a really, really critical support structure, you know, mm -hmm. around yourself. Because it, regardless of what you choose to do with, with your life, it's the yeah. people around you that will bore you there. And also be that person for somebody else, exactly. recognizing that it takes a lot to see what you see. Yes. And so as much as you want other people to be that for you, please yeah. make yeah. a deliberate and intentional attempt to be that um, support structure for somebody else. And that's yeah. how we all collectively rise. Yeah. And I, I totally mm. agree. And um, I have just speaked so much uh, from this conversation. And yeah, mm. uh, I think I'll just turn it over to a few questions we have from the chat. Um, mm. Johnny is asking uh, when finances were an issue. How did you ensure that you stayed focused to the end of the call? I assume you means finances for the program, not my personal mm -hmm. bank account. So, <laughs> <laughs> which is a different matter altogether. But uh, when when I mentioned that, there's two yeah. there's two ways I feel to sustain a program, um, yeah. uh, especially to grow one to the scale. One is to continue because I fundraise actively go to knocking on doors yeah. you know finding people who can fund us and so forth that's one way and and it's been successful like the scale that we've been able to develop our scholars program was made possible because of the investment from mastercard foundation and 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 that really helped us grow from one you know small scale program to a really massive scale program within a very short period of time so I, i'm not beating that that's a very important to keep fundraising and looking for prospects and so forth but the other way that I think is very underestimated and very yeah. underrated, but I think is more important for sustainability is having members of your community owning pieces of your work. And mm -hmm. this way, I just really applaud um, the, the our communities, like our colleges that much fund our scholars program. They mm -hmm. make sure that the scholars are well, they are funded for their scholarship, but they also have a thriving environment. We're able to yeah. support them when things go wrong. And our colleges partners that support our visiting fellowship program, the departments that 
put some of the funding aside for the scholars, for sorry, for the researchers program, the many contributions in kind and in time and in treasure from yeah. various parts of the university that really tidied us over when things yeah. got really difficult. And yeah. I think it's it's a very underrated um, sort of contribution factor, but yeah. I think yeah. if you can really tap into your network, your community, yeah. 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 and have them, you know, own, own the program, own some bits of it, then you can be sure that you will be sustainable, even if the major funding and other philanthropy funding goes off. So some of the work we are yeah. doing at the moment is funded by our folks, um, by African alumni at Oxford, mm -hmm. right? Um, Kapi, Kapi is one of our greatest benefactors and many others yeah. that support the Ubuntu fellowships and so yes. forth. So making sure your community owns it um, yeah. is really, really critical. And yeah. being able to be that agile adaptive so sometimes you do 30 fellowships sometimes you do 10 you know yeah. and <laughs> being being adaptive with your fundraising yeah. um with your fundraising goals but also with yeah. your project goals is quite yeah. important i hope that answers it yeah, yeah i i, I mm -hmm. think that answers it thank you for that shamake mm -hmm. is also here and he says thank you so much for sharing <laughs> your wisdom and experience with us i am proud and grateful uh, of being an afox scholar i am wondering what your vision is about mentorship role in the afox program um i might need a bit more clarity mentorship for the scholars or mentorship from the scholars i mean the way i think about mentorship is um, two ways, absolutely critical, especially early stages in your career, because you're navigating things that most likely other people have navigated. And so having conversations with people is really critical and it helps you to clarify your own thoughts more than anything else. But as important as that is, I think we do not emphasize enough time for you to think about yourself and what is it that you want for yourself. It's very easy. I find some some of our wonderful scholars are hopping from one mentor to another, just hearing other people's experiences. And yeah. yes, you're being yes, you're being mentored, but more than yeah. that, you need to sit down with yourself, be yeah. uncomfortable for three hours on a Friday afternoon and say, What is it? What are my experiences? How yes. do I view the world? Yeah. What do I want for myself and for the people around me? What are my yeah. constraints? What are things I can and cannot do? What are my thinking? What is my thinking around my timelines for yeah. delivering some of the things that I want? And I think that process, that internal conversation, actually does more good for for you than you know hopping from one mentor. Our stories are very different, and our stories are guided by our past, the kind of parent I had, the kind of children I'm hoping mm. to have. All those things come into my mind and into my psyche yeah. as I give yeah. you know an opportunity for mentorship. And I think another, so thinking about your own journey and sitting with yeah. yourself a lot more than sitting with other people, I think is important. And mm -hmm. the second element is to think about mentoring that goes beyond, um, you know, how do I put this kindly, feel good moments, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, but goes beyond, can you put my name out for this and that, you know, yes, champions. Yes. yes. If, if there's a call for application, if there's a call for jobs, and I know that our scholars, so and so, Shama K is doing work on, yeah. you know, displacement and climate, for instance. I can yeah. call up and say, you know, you need to talk to so and so about this and that. And yeah. that I think should be emphasized more, even in mentoring re relationships. But as even as we seek out to talk to mentors to say, if, if there's an opportunity that you think I would be good for, please mention my name. A lot of our career decisions are made when we are not in the room. Mm, mm, absolutely. It's very important to recognize that. Absolutely. Um, and so make sure that when you're not in the room, there's somebody mm. mentioning your name in those rooms where the decisions about your life mm. are being made. Yeah, yeah, true, true. I totally agree. And Shamake says, yeah, thank you for, for that. Um, so there's another question from Moffat. He says, from your introduction, you mentioned that your science dates back to when you joined the clinic to dispensing mm -hmm. drugs and are now ex uh, experiencing immense growth. Any advice for young scientists who feels that they are stagnant? Um, stagnant, that's, you know, the truth is everybody feels stagnant at some point in their career. It's not just when you're young. I know my friends who are now in their 50s and are pivoting, you know, to different careers. So don't put a lot of pressure on yourself at every stage in your career, at every phase, there will be a moment of feeling, what am I even doing here? So mm -hmm. just 
that's normalized saying that it's okay to feel like mm. you're not doing the most, you know, yeah. all the time. That happens at most stages in your career. There, there are phases of high growth. There are phases of, you know, like um, I'm, 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 I'm glad I can say this because I'm among scientists. It's like a bacterial growth curve. You know, you just go. Yeah. Sometimes you're in the lag phase. Sometimes you're in the log phase. Yeah. Sometimes you're plateauing, and then yeah. it goes overnight. S S curves. Um, and that's okay. That happens. Use that time to learn. That's how I think I have navigated my stagnant points. Whenever I feel like I'm not going anywhere, and this is just my personal way of dealing with it, yeah. is I spend that time learning. I will yeah. take up a course. I will take up an apprenticeship with somebody. I'll do a secondment. I will take time to learn. And as long as I'm learning, I feel like I'm moving. Even yeah. if it's not visible, I'm spending yeah. that time incubating, growing internally. And then when it's time for the log phase, I have enough momentum, you know, I have enough sort of activation energy to pull me out and 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 allow me to grow. So at every stage in my life, I've had those moments where I'm, yeah. I feel like I, I need to either learn a new skill. And it can be as little as, um, you know, learn how to cycle. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. Yeah. It can yeah. learn a new instrument. Yeah. And, yeah. and once you, once your brain engages that that section yeah. of um, on on the learning trajectory, then you're yeah. on the growth trajectory, yeah. and that's yeah. how I've navigated my stagnant mm -hmm. points. Um, but other people will have different ways of managing that. But for me, I find taking that time to learn something new, yeah. exciting, yeah. a different direction, maybe, um, has been very helpful in in, in managing managing the the plateau phases. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So Louisa says, I'm glad to have joined this session. The first and definitely not missing anymore. She also says on the mentorship part, great wisdom. Um, yeah, that's from Louisa. And then Brenda says, thank you, Dr. Ann, for the talk. What advice would you give to a young upcoming researcher from Africa? And I think that would be our last question. Yeah. Okay. Um, I tend to not give advice per se. Um, I think I, I prefer to give multi, po, po, points of reflection yeah. and then see what is it that resonates with you and, and where you are on your journey. When I sort of started a research career um, in, in, in Kenya at the time, it started from just inquisitiveness and it was a job that was available. Everybody who did biochem you know, would end up in Kilifi or in Ildri or ECP. There were like four or three choices. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we didn't know, we didn't know the level the, the the what we were even playing at. We had like four yeah. options. And that, that was as much as you know was available for you. But yeah. we live in a different world now, right? We live in a different world now. You can access opportunities in industry, in NGOs, in, in corporates, in whatever. So open your open your mind a little, uh, cast mm -hmm. your net wide, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and be open to you know shifts in what you thought your your trajectory mm -hmm. would look like. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second thing I remember from my own journey was this feeling: once you left science, you like failed. You know, <laughs> yeah. I remember vividly, vividly. Yeah. I think I was in I was in second year um, yeah. and we had this women in science event and they yeah. showed this leaky pipeline of how many women get yeah. into graduate programs and then they yeah. start dropping off dropping off yeah. and it was it was expressed to me and I know that wasn't the intention but it was expressed yeah. to me as if you left you know academia or active yeah. basic research you've leaked out of the pipeline and yeah. <laughs> Yeah. That's a very narrow way of defining academic careers. I mean, it's exactly. a very narrow way of thinking about yeah. research careers. Your skills, your thinking, your ways of being. Just this week, I was in a diagnostics conference at Ruben yeah. College. So fascinating. I was excited by the research because it still resonates with me. Yes. Um, yes. But but I am you know it's good to not think of yourself as the thing that leaked out yeah. of the pipe. <laughs> You're contributing. Yeah to the ecosystem in yeah. one way or the other. Yeah. So it's important to think of research careers as broader than just yeah. linear. And we know that opportunities in academia are very scarce. You yeah. know, so if you limit your possibilities to just being a researcher within a research organization in a university, it becomes yeah. a real challenge. The yeah. other thing I challenge myself with, which I haven't been great at, and I hope I will be better, it's on one, on my learning objectives yeah. <laughs> is to be able, and I am inspired by you, Ruth, and many others, is to be able to 
narrate the story of the research that we do. And I think one of the challenges with older generation or African researchers is that we were never taught the skills of translating research, talking about the impact yeah. of research to our communities, explaining to people in other fields what, what this thing we are doing, why the genomics of that particular yeah. B cell, you know, yeah. why should anybody care about that T cell that you're looking at in your yeah. fax machine? Why should yeah. it matter, you know? Yeah. And and I think what upcoming scientists, especially young African scientists, can do better yeah. is by being very deliberate about making science a, a and no, normalizing science, you yeah. know, normalizing it the way we are. I see my son excited about, you know, going to space because it's normalized. It's in their yeah. everyday interaction. Yeah. I want to see them. My my cousins growing up in Isiolo, talking about, you know, the moon landing because you yeah. as an astronaut talked about it or talking about the new cancer therapeutic that you are working on you know so yeah. I think that's an opportunity that we have with you know social media and connectivity and being more um, deliberate about how we talk about our science in ways that I think that the few past generations would have wanted to do a bit more of but were so caught up in just getting by and getting you know the research grants and all of those things going but I think African young researchers have got an opportunity now to make African African research a lot more visible and a lot more sexy. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for joining us on this MSP session. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and see you on the next episode.